Hello. Welcome to this talk. Uh, we have a few people here in, uh, um, in this auditorium, and we have a recording going on. So uh, we'll talk about Signot and uh, what it has for us uh, today and what we're going to be working on in the future. First, let's us introduce, introduce ourselves. Hi, uh, I'm Runal. I'm an engineer at Red Hat, Signode uh, uh, tech lead and co-chair. So my name is Dan Chen, and I'm from Google, a software engineer, and I've been in this project before inception, and uh, for more than 10 years, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm Sergey. I'm a chair of Signot and one of the approvers. Under uh, mentorship of Don and Brunel, I'm uh, new relatively to this project, like only four years, comparing to like uh, 14 or 15, 20, uh, some people claiming. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, so with that, let's uh, get into uh, the meat of it. Can I turn aside? Okay, so depending on where you are with Signode, you may imagine it differently. Sometimes when I'm thinking about Signode, I'm imagining this beautiful building and then somebody is building some DRA on top. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, but I mean, it really depends on where you are on this journey uh, and uh, how you see uh, different components of it. Pretty soon, this like ugly thing on the top will convert into something very beautiful, and then next next person coming up in the project will see everything as a one monolith, one beautiful building. So, um, but what we'll be talking about, uh, we will discuss what is Signot, what we own, and uh, what kind of we built in here all together, and then we will discuss what we recently built. Uh, and uh, finally, we'll go into the future, what we're going to be building, what kind of trends we see, and uh, what challenges we need to respond into Signode. So, introduction to Signode. Many in this auditorium know what Signode is, uh, but it's never, uh, uh, never too much to discuss what, what we're doing in Signode. So, like, in Signot, like in the past when we've been drawing Signot, I mean Signot is all about uh, what happened in a node. So imagine you have some containers you need to run and some scheduler decided to put it in specific uh, uh, some um, scheduler decided decided to put it in some container, uh, container ships, and every container ship is a node, and this node decides where exactly to put it, how to put it so it wouldn't fall off, or like if it uh, starts burning, we'll throw it of the board and uh, continue running. So in the past, when you draw this, building, uh, this picture, you have a container runtime as an engine, you have Kublet as a manager of this engine and something else. Nowadays, you need to draw more pictures. Like now, we're talking a lot about AI ML, we're talking a lot about uh, extra devices. So Kublet by itself already not enough to manage all those devices. So we have plugins. Uh, today we have two different types of device plugins, device and DRA, and we have CSI plugin as well for complexity, and we also have uh, some monitoring on top of it, like an NPD. So, yeah, uh, to reiterate, uh, component, like, Signot owns all the components on Node, uh, and those components are some pieces how we iterate with, like, Kublet as a main component, and then uh, components we iterate with is container runtime, we also iterate with uh, some resource management, we do it inside Kublet itself and outside as well. Uh, we have device plugins for big devices, like accelerators or networking device. Uh, we have uh, monitoring, like not problem detector. It's more of a watchdog than monitoring. Uh, we have different monitoring solutions as well. Uh, we all don't own them too much, uh, but we own everything that is, um, all the telemetry is going outside of Kublet, we review it. And then uh, storage and networking components, uh, how we Iterate, operate with them, how we uh, pass some callbacks, and how we tell them what's going on on a node. So all those components are owned by one SIG, and you can imagine it's like such a huge uh, um, set of components and huge number of people working on all of that. And uh, it's all needed to run everything efficiently, run everything uh, great, but it's all on the same node. So right now, we can optimize you, but we, acti we can only optimize to what we see on the node, and cannot optimize beyond that. For optimization beyond the node, we have uh, higher level components. Um, and then you can imagine like this such a big set of uh, uh, components and uh, ownership we have. We have a lot of things happening right now. We have 
uh, five working groups now. It was four last year. We have uh, 11 sub-projects. We have, uh, I mean, just uh, share participation in our Slack channel, in our uh, email list. Uh, we can reach a lot of people uh, interested in Signode uh, by just being there. And then uh, CAP-wise, uh, we are leader of CAPs. A CAP is uh, enhancements that we do in Kubernetes. Signode is a leader uh, across the board. It's like not even distant second, like we, like I think second place, maybe five caps. So like we, we, we are running on double digits for a long time already. And uh, you see uh, every release we need to review and track um, some 36 uh, uh, caps and then out of them, some of them will be tracked, some of them will not be tracked. And out of them, some of them will be implemented and some of them wouldn't be implemented. And we need to reiterate again next uh, cycle. But it's a big number, and uh, if you participate in and you uh, just bring in something in, just remember that there are so many things happening uh, simultaneously that uh, it's, uh, you just need to bring a lot of attention to us to make sure that uh, your cap is also moving along. And yeah, if you just watching what's happening and uh, like just watching the PRs and issues uh, uh, being filed for Signal, it's just a huge number. And we have meetings, we have two meetings every week, uh, one for triage and, uh, and one for just overall what's happening. And the triage meeting is one hour of uh, basically triage. Like you, all we do is uh, looking at what, what's happening and how we can uh, improve the project. So uh, that's a lot of things happening. And with that, I want to pass to Don to uh, explain what we're doing right now, what just happened. Thanks, Sergey. And uh, today, I've been so excited here, being here and uh, together with the menu. And uh, I'm going to show what we have been done. And uh, if some of you guys went to the KubaCon this year, Europe, this year, earlier, I remember I announced, I said, OK, Kubernetes is going to shift from the node focus to the work node focus. Right? So whole Kubernetes also will shift to that, uh, and the node play the critical role there. So that time, I promised several features, I remember. And today is the chance I come here to report back to everyone here and what we have done. And uh, some of those important features. Right, so, so just like Sergey mentioned that Kubernetes signal always is the uh, top one or two. Actually, I think always top one. <laughs> no, there's no doubts. And the top one have the most of the feature development, most of the cap tracked and uh, uh, development over each release. And you can see that in the 1.32, and one of the biggest, one of the big focus for Signal, it is um, allow, give you, allow you, uh, give you more the uh, power and flexibility for the resource management um, on the, uh, your Kubernetes cluster. So you can see that uh, from this table highlights all the key uh, functionality, key uh, features we've been development uh, uh, over this uh, uh, development cycle, and uh, and range from the alpha to bad, uh, to the stable um, and on the various various areas. And in this release, we actually um, uh, improve. Uh, made the improvement on the device, the special device management, and also the s dynamic scale about of the resource uh, for your, based on your workload needs. And also we even leverage of the swap memory for the better resource management and all those kind of things. You can see that. Okay, first let's celebrate some of the major milestones and uh, of the some of those in this release. And uh, we have the uh, two. Actually, there's the DRA also, and uh, but but it's not included here. But the first needs to celebrate of the stable. Uh, um, so there, there are two features. One of it is the, uh, we introducing about a uh, sleep action for pre-stop hook. And uh, this is graduated to the stable. This is uh, simplify a lot of the graceful shutdown and experience for customer, for the users, and uh, avoid of unnecessary, complicated of the customer scripts, and also the workarounds uh, in the system. And another thing it is, uh, we finally, finally graduate of this dynamic uh, sizing mem uh, the, the memory back the one to the stable. And uh, this is actually the feature actually uh, help the improve of the utilization. So you can 
can dynamically adjust about your well-known temporary effects, such as those kind of things, and based on your pod limits. Um, and uh, so this is uh, super useful and uh, improve of the overall utilization and uh, all those kind of things. Another thing it is we have the two features, actually more than two features, but it's not listed here. And um, uh, list here is the two features. One is the pod, uh, uh, in place pod resizing, and it's going to finally, after five, six years, hard working debate over. And, the fi and also in the 1.27, it is alpha, and now finally it's beta in this release. And um, so I'm going to talk about more about this one later. And then we also have like the uh, support to drop in Kubernetes config directory, and this is make uh, management much easier. And uh, so then you can see that on this table, there's the many of new uh, uh, alpha features and uh, and include about the toning about the crash loop back off features. And this is really critical for a lot of workloads, especially for AI uh, uh, machine learning workloads. And uh, we are going to continue to improve this one. And uh, yeah, so please try those features and give us the feedback and the inputs and complain if it's done works for you. So let's dive into some some of the really most impactful features in this release. And uh, uh, let's start from the, uh, the most popular one, most famous one, and the latent is the device resource assignment, right? Uh, previous called uh, dynamic resource allocation, or DRA, so you can think about the naming, history, it means this is complicated, and also history, we have non-history on these features, right? So. So before DIA, and uh, so the management of those special, uh, let me start exaggerate this, okay, first. So this feature, actually, I really think about this game changer for a lot of, uh, for every, anyone running off the special workload. And those workloads actually using the, um, those special hardware, like the GPUs, TPUs, and also customer network devices, right? So, this is a little bit exaggerated, maybe, but that's what we believe. So this is why I put a lot of effort on this one. So before DIA, okay, so to manage those kind of special devices is really complicated, and it's hard management. And uh, uh, the so so with the DIA, introduce a standardized of the framework and uh, to manage those special devices, which is simply for the overall pipeline and the overall of the cluster operations, right? So the f one of those key things is DIA. It is uh, allow those driver, those special device driver expose their resource well structured uh, format, structured uh, way, and which it is make of rest of the world ecosystem and is to utilize those kind of things much better. For example, and uh, in this release, and the DIA is getting even better because we graduating of the structure parameters for the for those special devices of, uh, to the beta and add enhancement for the scheduling. To utilize, leverage those structure, uh, structured uh, uh, parameters, actually there's a huge improvement of the scheduling and, uh, and the scheduling. We are talking about uh, 16 times faster of the scheduling. So this is make of this feature, part, small part of this feature, it is GA. Uh, not GA, sorry. But, um, so, and also in this release, and uh, we are introduced, we are allowed the driver owned, uh, introduce of the driver owned resource claim status. This uh, Particularly, feature is really important uh, uh, to enable of those advanced multiple uh, networking use cases, addressing those scenarios, because uh, we actually allow those device driver can have more control about how those network device is being allocated and used. So this is give them grant of their more flexibility, more power, and uh, then. Another thing we make a huge progress, it is um, integrate about the DRA with the cluster auto scaling. Thinking about it, and now you can auto scale up your cluster and 
uh, with those special devices and expensive devices and based on the need about your workload, right? So it's instead you are uh, over -prom uh, provisioning those kind of things and uh, statically configure your cluster to support those jobs. This is particularly useful for those serving jobs, right? So, and on the other hand, it is uh, uh, the ecosystem to using of the DIA actually is booming. And uh, there's the example driver and uh, NVIDIA. Uh, GPU drivers are product ready. And uh, you can try with those kind of things. And also the CNI and the Google TPU driver is uh, um, under development. And uh, more those kind of things will come in. And uh, please uh, just help us to uh, polish all those kind of the API and uh, add the driver and, and uh, build this ecosystem. There's also have the more roadmap. And uh, uh, Patrick and, uh, and John and uh, Kevin, who are leading this effort, actually have the several talks in this Kubecon. And please follow up those kind of take a look if you have more um, interest. And I steal this slide from Patrick's talk. The reason it is, is so people can navigate through because it's no different from the previous, what I'm talking about, benefit and all those kind of things. And But you can click all the links if you want to know the details, design and implementation and the testing status, all those kind of things go just. Okay, next up, it is one of the features also for years in place powder resizing and finally, finally better. And, um, and um, so this is in place powder resizing. Actually, it is uh, uh, allow you dynamic the scale adjust of your powder resource uh, allocated for your powder on demand based on the workload uh, nodes, right? So, and also you can adjust their resource and without uh, a void of unnecessary of the downtime for and the service interruption. So, so this feature we've been developing this feature for years and uh, mm, and. Uh, Sorry. And this is one, the feature itself actually give you the work node the Elasti 60 and make them, it is adapt to the work node uh, change dramatically. Think about uh, some of the uh, uh, work node uh, um, is running smoothly all the time and uh, all of a sudden and uh, uh, experience some increasing about the surging uh, some of the resources surging, uh, doing some special event or all the other things, and you don't need um, to readjust about the CPU and the memory and uh, uh, put them down, and actually you can dynamic adjust, in place adjust those kind of things, make this continue uh, running. Right. So this is this is really powerful things, and because doing this kind of things, and then we are actually allow you even more optimize your resource allocation and utilization, and uh, Reduce and let us reduce those waste and uh, expensive of the compute uh, power waste. This is actually direct uh, transmit to the donor saving, right? So the cost saving for your for your uh, for your work nodes or for your cluster. And of course, the last one it is um, this one actually give the possibility you can dynamically correct of the resource misconfiguration without the downtime. Right, so really shut down of your code and those things. So anyway, this feature, it is the win-win all around. And uh, so for this one, so please try this feature in your uh, testing environment and give us the feedback. We are continue, we are improve of those kind of things. I got this, uh, last night I got this spreadsheet. And because I proved last uh, uh, PR just yesterday, um, and uh, and then last night is merged finally. So then I can see it is better. So same idea. So you can navigate through. You can see this is what we are doing during the one data thirty two. This time development phase, and we have the, so many other things. This is not all actually, uh, but the major change all included in this uh, uh, screenshot. <laughs> Now let's move on to the new features, Power Life Resource Specification, and now it is alpha. We, um, uh, yeah, we start. Talk I talk about these features like many years ago. I, I remember, and but we never really um, 
committed to doing this. Uh, even we introduced pod level C group many years ago, and we introduced after pod overhead, and but we I we never really get around to, to commit to do this. Finally, it's here. So this feature basically it is allow you um, uh, allow you, you instead of uh, uh, define uh, assign uh, the container uh, each individual container resource requirement. So we allow user to define resource requests and limits for the pod as a whole. Right. So then you don't need uh, um, it is reduce of simplify the resource allocation simplify the uh, Get rid of those complexi complexities to calculate of the resource requirement for individual containers, right? Just think about uh, uh, this is especially useful for those complicated part which you have uh, tied coupled uh, several of the containers in inside one part, and they may be uh, experienced about uh, uh, traffic peak at a different time, and then actually you can put them together and uh, and uh, assign about the part level of the resource. Need the container dynamic to figure out how to best utilize the resource assigned to the entire uh, part. Of course, this is the same as the in-place part resizing. They are optimize of the resource utilization and reduce the waste, right? So you can charge, actually you can charge the real usage based on the part usage uh, for the customer. This is also kind of like, uh, uh, in, uh, have those some cost saving benefits for the users. So, and uh, like what I say, think about the application, have the tight couple of those services. And just like, for example, imagine uh, e-commerce, um, those resource and uh, uh, doing of the uh, shopping session and uh, so um, so how you are going to manage of those kind of things and also like the streaming uh, services how you are going to manage those kind of things and this is basically give the flexibility to how you adapt to chart to change your workload based on the different type of the nodes over the times so this is alpha and uh, mm, so and the the feature itself is super useful and powerful uh, as its own. But to think about uh, together with uh, powder res uh, in place powder resizing together, this is even more powerful, right? So you uh, you are not just ju you need not just individual of the container. You can adjust about this share pool of the resource and the need container based on those kind of the services. So um, so all those kind of things is. So last one, let's, let me talk about uh, the node swap support. And uh, we've been developing this also for years. Traditionally, and the Kubernetes community, especially Signal, especially myself, and really uncomfortable to introduce uh, swap uh, into, the, uh, into the system because just giving uncertainty, giving off the performance, and giving off the unpredictability about uh, uh, for the workload, right? So, and uh, this is really hard. But we also cannot ignore the valid use cases, right? So for uh, swap canon, especially for those VM, I think the VM use uh, container use cases, and uh, so and also uh, for the uh, booming about like the stateful side workload. At this time, even you cannot, even you cannot uh, 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 in that increase of the resource on the giving giving node, especially for those biomental use cases, and uh, you cannot dynamic to add more uh, resource and uh, to the physical node. And uh, but uh, you are temporary suffer about of the memory spike, right? So what you can do? So so this is why actually add this kind of add extra buffer to your system and allow those kind of work node can uh, um, to handle those temporary of the memory spike and uh, more efficiently instead of evict them and kill them all those kind of things. So this is why we are we are committed to doing this one. And uh, so the 
we proactively work on this one, and the team actually conduct of the extensive of the stress test to make sure this work uh, based on what we are expected and performs meet our performance requirement. And one of the challenge which is actually make us not. Uh, uh, promote this to better, it is just figure out uh, eviction management uh, integration, right? So we want to still make sure uh, 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 improve of the eviction manager and make sure there's the job using of the swap and uh, avoid of the swap situation, situation and also protect the node, uh, prevent node from the instability, those kind of things. So, uh, but the next, but this is a high priority, so we're Hopefully next time I report back, this is already better or GA. So yeah. So now I'm going to hand over to Manu for other things. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> uh, thanks, Don. Uh, so Don covered all the big items that are happening in Signal, right? So we want to make sure we also highlight the smaller improvements that still improves the life of a Kubernetes admin or a user. So here are a few caps to call out. So first one is for allowing special characters in environment variables. So previously, there was a limit on what, uh, what characters you can use, but now it's been expanded to cover all the ASCII characters except uh, the equal to. Uh, the second one is uh, about splitting standard out and standard error lock stream. So in some cases, you may only want one of the two, and this cap is working towards making that possible. The third one uh, by Akihiro here in the audience is for improving the security. Um, so if you have mounts and sub-mounts under those mounts, in most cases, you want to make sure that uh, when you make the top-level mount read-only, you also want the sub-mounts under that mount to be uh, read-only. So we uh, introduced uh, this cap to add that feature to make Kubernetes uh, more secure. And the final one is, uh, when you're using CPU manager and you're using guaranteed pods, your burstable and best effort pods can still go and use up your reserved CPUs. Now, this can interfere with your kubelet or your other system demons, right, which is bad. You want a clear separation. You want to protect your system demons uh, from your workload pods. So this uh, kept uh, isolates uh, those CPUs just for the system and the burstable and the best effort pods don't interfere and run on those CPUs. All right, so uh, Don covered the motivation for introducing pod level resources. So I'm gonna go a bit uh, deeper into that, into the implementation of how it works. So while well, I'm now switching off to, oh, you wanna talk about it first? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to mention a couple things. Like we're talking about a lot from user perspective, like what user feature we enabled, what we did for users. But uh, from maintainer's perspective, if you want to contribute and you interest what happened, <coughs> we didn't put it on slides. We did a lot of work uh, in testing, for example, in this release. So we injected, uh, we started doing uh, error injection in CRI testing. We do, did uh, error injection device plugin testing. Uh, we introduced uh, systemd uh, watchdog for kubelet. So we're doing, like, beyond all the user-facing features, there is a lot of happening uh, under, under the hood. So if you're joining us, uh, there is plenty of work for everybody, all different sorts of work. Yeah, sorry yeah. about that. Uh, thanks, Sergey. <laughs> all right. Uh, so going back to pod level resources. So this allows you to specify resources at the pod level. Like today, typically you specify your memory or uh, CPU limits or requests uh, at each container level, and then they are aggregated or added up at the pod level. So now with this cap, uh, you have the ability to just specify the values at the pod level, and your containers can now uh, work within that threshold. And this can work out in cases where all your container resource picks are not hitting at the same time. So you're basically, uh, you have more capacity on your nodes. So one thing I want to call out is this is entirely opt-in. This doesn't take away the existing feature where you specify things at the container level. You can do that, and you can mix the existing uh, container level uh, limits with the pod level limits, and there's a whole table on how it works. Uh, so the initial support uh, was added for memory and CPU it will be expanded uh, for other resources. Also, this is going to be C groups V2 only. 
So if you haven't already migrated to V2, please, please migrate. This is like carrot for getting folks onto V2. Uh, all right, so there are some uh, rules uh, for specifying pod level resources. Like no individual container limit can exceed the pod level limit. The pod limit, if specified, must be less than or equal to the sum of individual container limits. And then if a pod request is specified and the container requests are specified, the pod request must be greater than uh, the sum of the container resources. This fits in the mental model of how the container level uh, requests and limits work today. So now uh, we can look at this, but what will be more interesting is looking at a live demo. So the code is fresh. It just got merged code freeze last week. Let's see uh, if we can get working here. All right. Uh, so I have the Kubernetes cluster up with the pod level resources uh, feature gate enabled. So this is how you would specify container level resources today without this feature, right? Say you have two containers, an HTTPD container and a Redis container. You give 100 megs to HTTPD and 150 to Redis. And this is how it looks with pod resources. So instead of specifying individual container level uh, numbers, you just specify them at the pod level. Now let's try running these pods. OK, so we have both the pods running. So first, we're going to go and inspect the old style pod. So this is the HTTPD container. Uh, let's inspect the memory limit. It's 100 megs, as S set in the spec. Now let's inspect the Redis in there. Redis is running. And it has 150. And at the pod level, uh, it, it should be 250 if, you, if we go and inspect that, OK? But now I'm going to uh, switch to the other pod. So we are in the Redis container. And if we look at the limit, Cat, yep, <laughs> thanks. All right, so it can go up to 250 because that was the pod level limit. Now inside the HTTPD, it's also 250. Now we're going to wonder, is it, isn't that adding up to 250? But wait, that's not the full story. Uh, we'll go back. We're going to inspect the pod level C group. So from here, I want to get the name of the pod. It's, it's pod BB2CA. So we'll go to QPods, BB2CA. And here, if we do a memory max, it's again 250. So now the pods can individually all go up to 250, but pod as a whole is restricted to 250. 
as long as they're not hitting the 250 at the same time and they are like adding up to 250, then this works out. So this is like a short overview of what this feature is about. And you can still uh, like mix and match resources and limits at the container at the pod levels to, uh, to make it work for your use case. So now I'll hand it back to uh, Sergey. So I think we're running out of time here. So I will try to be uh, brief and uh, try to tell you what is happening right now. So um, what we see in, and uh, what we're working on in Signode is, is the time up? Yeah. OK. Uh, <laughs> so um, we, we see more and more workload-centric um, improvements rather than uh, not in infra-centric improvements. So we're talking less about how we uh, get infra uh, assigned to uh, ports. We're thinking about how this port wants to consume the infra, how this port wants to consume the resources. And uh, we found that, um, I mean, this is like Houston, we have a problem moment uh, happened when uh, we have more and more frameworks like Kubre in this picture having a thing called node port, uh, not port. So, a pod node. So, port that is actually an, a node for them and they schedule something inside this port. So now, you, you remember like we are not team, but now we ha hosting small ports and each port, has, like maybe port, big ports, but each port has an orchestration inside this port. So each port becomes an individual node. We see similar picture in uh, VLLM right now. So we're working on a thing called uh, VLM instance uh, gateway. And this gateway routes traffic not to port, but to use case, to LoRa adapter inside this port. So port now consists of large model server, small LoRa adapters, and then instance gateway is directing traffic to this use cases rather than to the entire port. So port is no longer the unit of uh, what you deploy. It's not a unit of what you orchestrate. You orchestrate something inside the port now. And we see more and more use cases like that. And uh, this is a definitely a trend we want to address. And um, you uh, heard this like port level resources is uh, attempt to step into this direction. We have uh, uh, vertical auto scaling, another like uh, thing that uh, Don was talking about is also step in this direction. And we have more and more improvements like that to optimize for those scenarios. So we wouldn't have not ports any longer. We will have something that Kubernetes know about and can, can help, help orchestrate. And then other trends we see uh, are all related to devices being extremely expensive now. So we have solutions for every workload. Like every workload you have, like something fail, just recreate it. Like start from a scratch, like get a new node and like uh, create a new pod on it. But if you're talking about expensive device that is uh, cost like uh, a lot of money even per second, then you're talking about like minutes of downtime and then some jobs like training jobs in involves many, many nodes. Like so to run one big training right now, like I mean on hero training, like big uh, one, you need like uh, hundreds of nodes. So hundreds of nodes needs to work simultaneously and if one of them slugging behind, you're losing performance on all of them. So like multiply, single node being uh, out of rotation uh, to uh, this, uh, hundreds of nodes, and then neither of these nodes can make a progress because of this one guy. So uh, we see more and more situations when port becomes a very expensive and very cherished resource, and you don't want to uh, build or break it. You don't want to uh, unallocate it and allocate it in different place because it's super expensive. It's, uh, uh, we see it more and more. So. It's not cattle any longer. Like you, I don't know if you remember talks from early Kubernetes, like don't look at your container as a uh, pet. It's a cattle. You can kill it. You can recreate it. You can uh, scale it. Uh, now it's not the case any longer. Uh, at least for a while, we'll have super expensive devices and everything will be uh, very expensive. And we need to start looking at port as a uh, pet. And then dynamic ports, I just uh, discuss this and uh, we have many, many things that uh, contribute to that, like even DRA that we're working on. In the past, device plugin, that would uh, uh, interface that we come up a long time ago, it was assigned to containers. Now DRA is assigned to ports. So some resources you assign to port rather than cont individual containers, and then containers inside the port can share this resource. So you orchestrate in ports, uh, but then like, Port orchestrates resources inside, the, uh, inside, inside itself by sharing this resource among containers. And uh, 
in the beginning, I also said that uh, we only look at Node as a unit of information. It's very simplified view. Like, you, if you only care about what's happening on a Node, you kind of living in this like small little world, which is uh, uh, nice and happy, uh, and you don't care about scheduling, and like you just make a decision, tell me what to do. Um, that's not the case any longer. So we have more and more devices that interconnected between uh, nodes. So node needs to know which GPU to allocate this specific port, because this GPU is connected to that GPU, and uh, you need to know that they need to work together. Uh, we have more and more scenarios when port is not a unit of deployment, and in fact, there is like, um, like things like LWS, Laser Working Set, is a new controller that will allocate multiple ports all together, and they can only work when they all work. If one port failed, every other port is also not needed, and it's a totally new scenario for us. Like now, you need to think about how you kill ports very efficiently, very fast, so they will be recreated all together uh, on a different uh, system, uh, super fast without all the graceful uh, termination and like possibility to, to get delayed and stuff like that. And uh, gunk scheduling is uh, also the same, so if you have a training job, you need to schedule all of them together. How do you make sure that you have enough like, let's say you, you want to schedule 512 ports, how you make sure you have enough resources everywhere pre-allocated so you can schedule it, you don't have any delays, you don't have anybody just lag, lagging behind. Uh, that's all very important, and it's all uh, in, in the future uh, what we would want to solve. And now, if you feel that it's an engaging area, uh, or it's just in general, just uh, I wanted to, to spend a little bit of time to uh, explain how you can get engaged. Um, so we cherish any contribution. Sometimes it's harsh to contribute to Kubernetes because the uh, bar is very high uh, for every contribution. Uh, but uh, if you're serious about it, we welcome and uh, we help everybody. Um, our favorite contributions are improving test coverage, uh, fixing bugs. Um, our Favorite but uh, expensive contributions that we really want you to think about your commitment uh, in uh, ahead of time is uh, feature contributions and uh, uh, feature implementations take a lot of time and if you want to commit on that we want to know that you are serious about it and you are not just uh, passing by and like you thought that it may be a nice, nice improvement and you're not ready to spend enough time on that and then code reviews is also always welcome we don't have enough reviewer power. Uh, and with number of caps we drive in every release, it's uh, very important. Uh, and then there are plenty of non-coding contributions. We all busy people. We we need to uh, make sure that everything is taken care of. Like, and we have so many uh, pokes from sick dogs, from uh, uh, how we run our meetings, how how people uh, need to get information, uh, annual reports that we need to publish. All of that requires attention. And uh, if you want to help with that, and you're not ready to start on uh, code contributions, we also welcome that kind of contributions, and uh, we have a place for that for sure. And then, why Signal? I, I don't know if you convinced yet. Uh, it's very serious SIG. Uh, get involved here, you'll be involved into everything happening in Kubernetes. Uh, everything touches Node, everything uh, other SIGs wants to do uh, comes back to us, and uh, we will uh, work with every SIG. So uh, if you want to work on fundamental of Kubernetes, Signal is the right place. Uh, we have uh, a lot of opportunities from very small to like extremely large. And you may notice that it's a turmoil time. Like we have AIML coming, we making post dynamic. I mean, I haven't even thought about it uh, a year ago. Now like dynamic code is normal for me. Um, and then community is amazing. We have so many great people. Uh, so you uh, just get involved and you allow it. And there are a few links how you can get engaged. Um, we have uh, many working groups, many uh, places you can uh, start with. Uh, and with that, I want to thank you for having uh, been here. And if you have any questions, please ask. And this is a feedback uh, link. Thank you for your presentation and for amazing features you provided. It's really awesome. And my question is about, well, resources for a pod, like shared resources. Well, imagine the situation in pod we have like two uh, containers which are kind of application containers 
and third container, which is kind of uh, observability container, which provides metric, et cetera. And will we have opportunity to, like, set um, the con con concurration behavior for these containers? Like, all these containers will concurrent for, for these resources, and how we will be able to handle it? Like, with the same uh, process we have in Linux, kind of nice CLI, which could handle it in terms of uh, processes. I think, uh, if you understand my question, thank you. Can you, can so, you summarize yeah. one more time your question a little bit? I can, I can try to answer, but uh, tell me if I'm going the wrong direction. So what you're talking yeah, yeah. about is a like big pod and you have a sidecar for monitoring. Yeah, yeah. That is for example, less in pod we have a lot of containers and how yes. we can actually uh, deal with this concurrency in mm. container. For example, mm. one container will uh, have a desire to consume all resources in this pod. Totally. Yeah. So actually, I can I can try to attack oh, this question oh. because I earlier I uh, talk about uh, both uh, in-place pod resizing features, right? So and also I talk about uh, then the pod level of the resource. I did oversimplify the things. Actually, the feature will be even more powerful. And <laughs> so so in your cases, what you are talking about, right? So this is why I talk about okay itself individual individual things. Thanks, and uh, and it is uh, is a powerful future, but the combination together actually is even more powerful. And you just give me a perfect example here. So so uh, you already have the application on container, and maybe you already do those due diligence to config about the, how your application container to uh, to for the resource limit and the request, right? So then there's the set card container, for example, you are using of the uh, um, uh, the services mesh, right? So inject of set card container, and then all those kind of things, everybody go crazy, right? Now set card container, right? So, so some of the set card container they also specify about you already upfront those those resource uh, limit for those kind of things, right? So you could, uh, uh, this part level of those kinds can be some of those, all those kind of things. And at the same time, also have the additional buffer based on those kind of things. So all those kind of things could be dynamic, uh, uh, configured uh, by the system, right? So the people adjust, people, Injected, you end up with certain services, for example, services mesh, and inject of the setup container. They also could, because we also have the dynamic, uh, the in place part the resizing, to could be add this uh, additional about the adjust of the part level of the resource. Just allow those setup container containers being injected. Right, so, and another thing it is, early I mentioned that, I said, oh, please try those features and tell us the input. This is for real, it's because I only talk about you could share, your container could share about the resource, like you can uh, not set off the resource limit and request, only have the pod level. Then let them be to dynamically figure out how to share, right? You also could pre-config your some of the application container to tell of the what's the request and what it is the limit. But at the same time, you give the additional buffer and then need several of that, not that important, best effort of the container, but they have to run in your pod to share of the rest of the code. So, but the problem it is right now, we have to figure out, this is literally engineer asking me, say, oh, which one we can do, right? There's the two use cases. One use case is it is we could leverage of the C group kernel, right? To guarantee one of those containers and always have the higher priority to access those resources because you do good job. I could, quality of the services today only on the pod level. I can go even further, right? So I can even go do the eviction management. And then what it is with management is the pod level and go deeper to the container level. Right? You can tell me scheduling level. So we can do, but this is one of the use cases, right? So a lot of use cases, it is, you could say container, you are have this release, uh, this resource limit and say, we are jail you, you cannot use more than this. And the rest of the part of the resource, or maybe entire of the resource can be used by other container. So they are burstable, they are important. This is why I ask uh, some 
feedback to us because this is an open question and and purpose in this alpha I told engineer it's not to solve this problem okay because we need more to understand uh, right so so we lower down the scope anyway just share with you hopefully I answer some of your question and try this and then give us the feedback we definitely because it's alpha and also another feature is beta so definitely not complete perfect right so but we are working toward that yeah can you hear me? Mm. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I uh, have like a question. Uh, you mentioned uh, stuff about pod is not uh, a unit of orchestration now, becoming not a unit of orchestration. And to be honest, it sounds a little bit scary because like for a lot of years it was like, <laughs> this is unit of orchestration, that's how you think about it. And now Can it's, I all this question? Uh, yeah. it's all changing and like, I said, like, it's a little bit scary. I just hope that, uh, and all the examples you mentioned were also about AI, but there's also not just AI stuff. So I hope, like, AI mm, doesn't mm. steer everything into direction where totally. it's, like, a bit too overcomplicated. Yeah. And maybe, like, some fi mm. features may, might be built into mm. Kubernetes. Maybe some left for, like, third-party things, like uh, Q with a K is, like, for... Uh, managing these like totally. Q, Q resources uh, and stuff like that. Uh, so I'm sure you're doing a great job. I just hope like this is like taken into account. So like in five years we don't look at it and, and mm, say like mm. oh it was wrong direction. We overcomplicated everything. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe I answer this question. If it's dynamic content. So, so uh, thanks, Sergey actually introduced this. Well, I was surprised to be. I didn't realize the slide deck later after. So I have this proposal. So, so I published this proposal. I have this thing since for years, uh, and until recently, booming of the general AI and the batch workload, and uh, make me think about. I have to talk about uh, maybe this is the future direction we are going. But on the other hand, I just want to clearly say that from day one and uh, from day one, Kubernetes design, I insist pod is the minimum scheduling entity. It's not execution. If you really see that, this is why uh, we introduce container runtime interface. And container runtime interface is not using pod as execution, smallest acquisition entity. And uh, and because Docker is don't feel like that way, right? Docker using a container. Docker is the only product ready container runtime. And also, not just that, also there's the policy, Kubernetes policy, and evolve. Uh, constant of you all until after 10 years we are still constantly you all. So that's what, that's why I add the node level or add like a data plan level. And uh, from day one, I mean, yeah, it is from day one. So the, the pod is a smallest scheduling unit and uh, for Kubernetes scheduler. Never it is a execution unit. I, try to correct this for years. So, so, so what uh, dynamic pod, actually still pod, it is the smallest unit, scheduling unit, and for the uh, Kubernetes at the cluster level to placement, right? So the only thing is this one, it is allow uh, uh, hierarchical scheduling, right? So all the existing of the features, you want to schedule static pod, still work, all those kind of things. Instead, it's just we allow the sum of level of the dynamic pod. Uh, and uh, so you can uh, allow some of the batch workload, like the Ray, like the Slurms, like many other. So, and uh, people build today, they can, uh, after those pods place on the node, right? So based on those whatever policy or, for, or whatever the hardware or device connected to those kind of things. And then workload will schedule their task which is container here, into those a group of the parts. And they will know, because workload, the batch workload knows more the dependency. They want to do finer grant of the resource management. They even know, for example, there's the something like the way I talk about the uh, DRA earlier, I'm talking about uh, the, we introduce of the uh, uh, status, the claim of the status, right? So those multiple network, uh, advanced network scenario, we need to support those kind of things. Because they understand which 
how to allocate all those network protocol connect to two load, and which container, two container maybe, or multiple containers, and lead contact using those, those network protocol connect to each other. So all those kind of things, we just incremental a number of the more powerful possibility and the capability for different type of the workloads. But existing one, we are enable for stateless workload or stateful set will be same. And only, I guarantee, we are put more effort to resource management. Hopefully, we can improve of the overall performance for those workloads. That's all. Hope I answer your question here. Yeah. And I also want to assure you that, uh, I mean, Kubernetes goes into waves. Like, uh, when I joined four years ago, it was like in the bottom of reliability. We had so many test problems and life cycle, pod life cycle was having problems just because we introduced a lot of features before that. And now we're kind of on a like high point when we very good uh, quality, uh, everything's stable, and we have a lot of uh, tests covering stuff. So now it's kind of... Every step we do it in, like, like Don said, it's every step is incremental steps that we heard feedback before. So it's not not just AML, it's just uh, feedback from uh, past years. And just like taking these steps now, like, and there are a lot of steps together that will help those kind of scenarios that we've been talking about in AML. Thank you. Thanks for the wonderful question. One more question. Thank you for the presentation. Um, we need to have a use case that we need to manage the local SSD, local SSD disk. I wonder whether we should use the DRA to handle it or we should model them as CSI. Or we should do both. It, I think it really depends on how you intend to use it. I don't think there are currently any efforts to uh, mix CSI and DRA. There's a CNI and DRA work interest group that's in progress, but it'll be worth exploring. Uh, so what we have going on is um, the split, split disk stuff, so where you can like spread your stuff across. Like you can have your uh, logs on one disk, you can have your main root disk on a separate disk, you can have your container images on a separate disk. And work is going on to make sure that the kubelet recognizes uh, these configurations and handles them better. Yeah, I think one deciding factor maybe for you is that uh, DRA may help you um, allow to spe specify and configure it such a way that ports will be scheduled with uh, some common properties between disk and GPU device and some other like networking uh, properties. If you have device that is like CSI drive, drive like whatever, like disk, that is very special and you want to match it to some other like NUMA node or some yeah. uh, environments, then DRA may be a better choice, but I think CSI is typically what you're going to use. <laughs> 